that we have another fantastic presentation. Uh, uh, Mr. Art Seavey is going to come in and uh, step up here and talk to you. Guess what? He's going to talk about abalone. And so uh, he, he is with uh, the, uh, the name of your company is the Abalone Company. Monterey Abalone Company. So please, a warm, well, fast welcome for Art Seavey. It's a real honor to be here, and it's a real honor to present with uh, Mike Graham as well. Uh, he's got a much, much better speaker and much more interesting than, than me, but uh, so that's why they put me first. Uh, okay, so yeah, um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about our company, uh, Monterey Abalone Company. We've been in business since uh, around 1990, uh, growing abalone on wharf number two. Uh, so we're an in-the-ocean abalone farm. Uh, right here in Monterey. Uh, let me find the right arrow. No, it's here somewhere. Boy. There it is. Sorry. Okay, so what are abalones? I, I, we get that question all the time. Uh, abalone via Spanish, abulon, from the Rumsen language. Uh, now the Rumsens, who are the Rumsens? <laughs> They were, that's the name of a group of, of uh, indigenous people of California that, that shared the Rumsen language, uh, which was spoken from the Pajaro River to Point Sur. So they were a local, local uh, uh, Indian group. Uh, so I always thought that was very interesting that the name, the, the word abalone comes from, from this, this group of, of, of people. And uh, apparently it was, uh, it was communicated to the Spanish uh, settlers uh, who who named this abalone and, and abalone are they have a worldwide distribution um, along the coast of every continent except as, as you can read here um, in California we have seven species of abalone uh, reds pinks greens blacks whites flat threaded and pinto uh, we farm the red abalone the red abalone are actually one of the biggest species of abalone in the world, and they grow uh, here in Monterey. We're approximately at the center of the red abalone's geographic distribution along the western coast of North America. And here you can see the approximate distributions for all those different species. Now, the, and the red abalone is this red line. can interbreed between the species. So uh, because they are broadcast spawners, they release their gametes into the ocean. Fertilization, fertilization happens in the water. Uh, the egg of a green abalone could theoretically encounter the sperm from a red abalone and would form a natural hybrid. And indeed, uh, there are some farms. Uh, now, this is, these are some different farming areas in California. Uh, where, where abalone farms are located, um, and one of the, the, the Santa Barbara farm uh, used to far, used to create in their hatchery a red green hybrid, with the hope that it would uh, grow faster, and it did grow faster in El Nino years because the green is like warmer water, but in a normal year the reds grew faster, so they eventually they ab abandoned that project. Uh, <clears throat> So we, we farm abalone, as I said, on the commercial wharf. This is a graphic uh, that was uh, published in the San Jose Mercury News, and it does a good job, I think, of kind of uh, explaining what we do. Uh, we start out with seed abalone. Uh, at the time that this article ran, we were actually buying our babies from some of the other farms that had their own hatcheries. So we started out with an abalone just a little over an inch, about 30 millimeters. It took us three years to get them up to the minimum size that we harvest them at, which is about uh, three and a half inches and uh, about a quarter pound in live weight. And so uh, we grow them in cages under the wharf. We have built some walkways amongst the pilings. 
we, you know, we're very fortunate to have, a, have this great kelp resource here on the Central Coast and in California. Uh, kelp is one of the fastest growing plants on the planet. It's been recorded to grow, I think in, in one paper I read, they said they recorded one plant that grew four feet in a day. Um, and that's, of course, under ideal conditions. Uh, in the winter time, uh, when, the sh when the day lengths are short and the nutrients are, are not as available, it, it doesn't grow much at all. But in the spring and summer and early fall, it really grows fast. And so kelp is a perennial plant. It uh, has a hold fast uh, root system that wraps around rocks on the bottom and it sends up fronds. Um, <clears throat> the kelp has several characteristics that lend themselves to harvesting uh, perennial, uh, very rapid growth rate. The fronds float. They have, uh, they have little gas bladders that float, the, the, that float them up to the surface. And then once it gets long enough, then it starts to you know, uh, lay across the surface of, of, of the water. So it's very easy to harvest. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, it's, it's, an, it's uh, and, and the abalone do, they do decently well on it, even as a sole source of feed. So this is a picture of uh, my business partner, Trevor Fay, uh, <coughs> lifting up one of the cages that we grow the abalone in. Uh, in his right hand, he has a, a, a winch control. We have a little hydraulic winch, and we lift the cages up and, uh, every day. We have uh, crews of guys who, two crews of guys who mostly what they do all week long is feed. <clears throat> so we have a couple of hundred cage, cages under the wharf uh, and they start at one end of the farm and work through all the cages down to the other end of the farm every week. Uh, it takes, so uh, from the time we bring the uh, seedlings onto our farm until they're that small, the smallest size we harvest at, which is about three and a half inches in shell length, it takes about four to five years. So it's a, it's a very slow growing uh, crop and very labor intensive. This is one, these are, here are a couple of cages. This one in, front of, in the front has been opened up so you can see these uh, sets of panels uh, inside the cage that, where the abalone crawl around. And here is a cage in the process of being fed. The fresh kelp is laid in between the panels, and the abalone uh, have a cartilaginous tooth that they use to to chew the chew the kelp into small pieces, uh, so they can rear up on their big foot, and then their front of the foot can form two lobes, which they can reach out and trap a piece of seaweed in between, and pull it underneath so they can chew on it. This is, a this is a, be a beauty shot, uh, and uh, <clears throat> one reason I included it was because you can see how the sort of a nice uh, tan golden color shell on the edge, uh, there's a sort of maybe a quarter of an inch of, uh, of new growth there on the edge of the shell that, that's, when, as a farm, an abalone farmer, I look at that and I'm, I feel satisfied because it says to me that the abalone are growing well, the, the conditions uh, in the ocean are good, they're getting plenty of food and, and happy and, and healthy. So I'm going to shift gear a little bit now and talk about uh, abalone production internationally. Uh, this kind of gives you an idea of where the United States is in terms of abalone farming nations. <laughs> uh, China, of course, is, is a giant, 110,000 metric tons in 2014. Uh, Korea has, has a, a rapidly expanding abalone farming industry. Um, in fact, uh, some of those bigger farms, those onshore farms, used to sell half their production in, in Japan. Korea is a neighbor of Japan. They farm the same species. That, that, and as you may have, if, if any of you, of you were here for Tim Thomas's talk, you probably got an idea of how important uh, abalone is to the Japanese. And they really prize their local species, uh, Haliotis discus hanai. And uh, the Koreans also are, you know, basically neighbors to Japan. They grow the same abalone, and they, uh, so they, they basically cut their production. I mean, their production cut the price in, uh, for, for California abalone in half in Japan. So those bigger farms had to find new markets, domestic markets for their production, 
their, they, their, their sales really slowed down, they stopped spawning, and uh, then all of a sudden their sales picked back up again because they opened those domestic channels. And that's when they told us they didn't have enough seed for us to, uh, because they, they need, needed it all for themselves. So that was, it was a far-reaching implication of a trade situation on the other side of the world that, that affected us. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, you can see the U.S., we produce about 250 metric tons of, of abalone in a year. And this is a reflection, I think, uh, that, uh, not just at the abalone aquaculture industry, but uh, worldwide uh, aquaculture, general aquaculture trends, current trends. And since we're on that subject, uh, you can see that uh, in 2011, I mean, just, this just gives you an idea of how minuscule American United States aquaculture production is. Uh, we're, we're, a, we're a drop in the bucket. And how that reflects in our, uh, so we have a, here in the United States, we have a, a trade deficit in, sea, in seafood that in 2011 was $11 billion, and I think it's closer to 14 or 15 now. Um, so we're, we're importing a vast, the vast majority of the seafood we consume. And I remember when I was in, in, in at university, uh, in, in the 19, early 1980s, uh, our professors told us aquaculture is going to be the blue revolution. In 50 years, uh, aquaculture will produce half the seafood cons consumed in the world. Well, that would have been, so 2030, he, he was saying that, well, here in 2012, we're, we're almost already there. And, and now we've, we've, aquaculture is producing probably more than half of the seafood produced in the world or consumed in the world. So that's, you know, we can see that it's, uh, it's, it's becoming more and more important to everyone in, 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 on our planet. So I'm sorry about the quality of this, but this is a quote from Time Magazine. Uh, American consumption of farm seafood is right in line with global norms. Half our fish comes from farm as, farms as well, but not from American farms. 84% of the seafood consumed by Americans is imported, and just 5% of the farm seafood we eat is, is grown here in the United States. And the reason I think that, that that is important is, is because, well, we, we talk about energy security, and I think food security is a, another issue. Uh, we don't, you know, it's not like we're going to all pass away if we can't eat seafood, but, but it's, uh, it's important, and it also, uh, we have, we're all concerned about the quality of the food that we eat, the standards under which it's grown, whether there are noxious chemicals or ingredients used, and if, if we produce our own seafood, at least we can be, we, we can feel confident that, that it adheres to the standards of, of our regulatory agencies. So I think it would be beneficial for us to... And finally, uh, what are the benefits of shellfish farming? Shellfish farming uh, is uh, very productive use of, of space. Uh, and there are facts and figures that say that it, it's per unit of space, per acre, uh, you compare shellfish farming to other kinds of animal production to, uh, on land, uh, and aquatic shell, you know, shellfish farming uh, compared to cattle or pigs or sheep or chickens is much more efficient per unit of space. And obviously, if you know shellfish, we talk about clams, mussels, oysters, scallops, abalone. Uh, all of those, except for abalone, basically feed themselves by filtering, you know, phytoplankton out of the water, and uh, so it's it's energy efficient. It's it's fish, very efficient for fresh water and as well as space. And finally, shellfish eat pl uh, local plant production. Local plants or all plants in in the in the ocean consume nutrients like nitrogen and, and phosphorus, and so when the when they so the, the, the nitrogen and, ph and phosphorus cons consumed by the, by, the, by the plankton or the seaweed gets absorbed by the shellfish, and when we harvest the shellfish, there's a net removal of those nutrients from the water. And so if you eat about 15 oysters a day, you can mitigate your own nitrogen excretion. And uh, <laughs> that's a polite way of saying something else, but, but it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's, it's a... It's, 
it kind of gives you an idea of why shellfish farming is great because it cleans the, cleans the water up. And I'm sure Michael will have more to say about that. And so uh, it's, it's also very tasty. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. They are still in business on, under a different name, uh, American Abalone now, but they're still producing abalone. Okay. Um, are, what is the possibility of having more abalone farms in the United States? Uh, you know, uh, when I, I got involved in, in uh, Monterey Abalone Company in 94, and uh, at, in the, in, by the late 90s, there were 13 farms in California, and uh, the rest of them have, have, for one reason or another, have, uh, have went away, and it's, it's very difficult to uh, get permits here. So I think that's uh, in California. The regulatory environment is is really strict, uh, and and the big the big hurdle is the California Coastal Commission. And uh, so you know, probably most of us have heard of that of them and how strict they are. Even just for you know, if you want to paint your house or or uh, put new windows in it or something. Uh, so it's it's uh, an expensive regulatory environment, and I think that's uh, one of the biggest hurdles. Thank you. When did the farming industry start in California? The farming industry started, uh, to my knowledge, I think there, the first farm might have been in the late sti 60s or the late 70s. I think the, the abalone farm in Cayucos is probably the oldest existing farm, as far as I know. And I believe I think they began in some form in the late 60s and, and are still producing a lot of abalone today. Thank you very much.